That's why we've gathered, assembled in this room this afternoon is to commemorate and remind ourselves and remember that this is the time of season that we commemorate the fact that Christ came into the world just like God promised. Thousands of years before it ever happened, before people could fathom it, God planned it. And so what you're going to see tonight is a culmination of our Advent services here at Grand Parkway. Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And each Sunday we had a theme. And each Sunday we lit one of these candles to remind ourselves. The first Sunday we we lit the candle of hope and we talked about that our hope is in Christ. Regardless of our circumstances, our, our hope is in who God is and what God says. The next Sunday we talked about peace. The peace that is ours in Christ. The Bible says of Jesus that he is our peace that has broken down every wall. We are all in on this fact. We think that it, it, peace is not possible until you, you, you make peace with God. Then the third Sunday, we talked about joy, just the joy. Jesus said, in a little while, your joy will be. And he, and, and he talked about the joy of a little while. And so uh, that's what we celebrate. And we, and we just slowed ourselves down every Sunday. And, and as, as people begin to get closer and closer to, to tomorrow, it's harder to hold that back. And yet that's the way God designed it. This past Sunday, we talked about love. The Bible calls us to love the way we were loved. And because God has demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I cannot get into heaven because I'm the pastor of this church. The only way I can get into heaven is because I I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I place my faith in Jesus Christ and the fact that he died on the cross as payment for my sins. And so we've gathered together in this room this afternoon to commemorate the arrival. Later on in our service, we'll light the Christ candle which is to signify and remind us and celebrate the fact that Christ came into the world. Everything we do tonight in this service will be about celebrating the significance of his coming into the world. Let me voice a prayer that we're going to celebrate together. You ready to celebrate? And let me say this before I pray. If your kids start crying, your husband starts crying, you ain't got to take them out. It's okay. It wasn't, I mean, when Jesus came into the world, it wasn't orderly. 
Matter of fact, the manger was a place of stench and cold foulness where beasts reside. And yet God said, I'm going to come into the world in that environment. We'll talk more about that a little later on. But for right now, just bow your head. Let me voice a prayer. and We're going to celebrate tonight, okay? God, let it be noisy in here, whatever it needs to be. Thanks for little kids that remind us not to take ourselves so seriously. You're serious enough. You're not somber. You're you're also celebratory. And so we commemorate that there's a light that shines in the darkness. There's a way out of us being who we've always been. That's why you came, and that's who you came for. Jacked up, screwed up, mixed up, and messed up people like me who need somebody perfect to pay the price that I could never pay. The Bible tells us that you had this in mind all along. That's why Jesus came. So we're here to celebrate and to remind ourselves and to remember that because he came, things are possible. So here is as we sing and celebrate the fact that he came. We're thankful for the arrival, and we look forward not to we celebrate his coming, but we look forward also to his second coming. So here, what we say tonight, we say it to you in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Let's stand together.
adore Him. Take a seat. Merry Christmas to the year of 20, 2015. You've arrived. You've made it. With all the hustle and the bustle, you're here. For most of us, we've heard the Christmas story at least once or twice. Maybe some of us have heard it so many times that we've lost track and have become callous to the beauty of into the vastness and the awe of what took place this very night. And for many of us, we know how this story will end. We know that the Messiah came, the baby was born. We know that God made promises, and we know that God kept promises. But hey, let's face it. We live in a jaded world where promises are made and scattered about without conviction, maybe possibly leaving us with some disappointment again and again. But this is not so with our Heavenly Father, who means and does exactly what He said He was going to do. And tonight, this afternoon, we invite you to hear the big story and be reminded of a God who keeps and makes His promises.
Nazareth. Long before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah promised that the Savior of the world would be born to a virgin. For hundreds of years, the people of Israel waited and wondered who it might be. In time, the angel of the Lord appeared to an unmarried teenage virgin named Mary, who lived in the small town of Nazareth. The angel told her that she was the one that God had chosen to give birth, birth to the child who would save the world from sin. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he was considering this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have marital relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Bethlehem. The town of Bethlehem was a small town of fewer than a thousand people whose only claim to fame was that Israel's great king David was born there. But once again, God chose the ordinary things of this world to carry out his plan of salvation. The prophet Micah promised that one day a shepherd king, even greater than David, would come from Bethlehem and rule Israel. Around the time that Jesus was born, the Roman government ordered a census for tax purposes. So young Mary and Joseph traveled to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem. While they were in Bethlehem, Mary's labor began, and she gave birth to a baby boy. But you, O Bethlehem of Pasartha, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel be, will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. And he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. 
The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hill. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus no Look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care. And feed us for heaven to live with thee there. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. a silent night There was blood on the ground You could hear a woman cry in the alleyways that night on the streets of David's town And the stable was not clean And the cobblestones were cold. Little Mary, full of grace, with the tears upon her face, had no mother's hand to hold. It was a labor of pain. It was a cold sky. For the girl on the ground in the dark, every beat of her beautiful heart 
was the labor of love. Noble Joseph by her side, calloused hands and weary eyes. There were no midwives to be found. On the streets of David's town In the middle of the night So we held her and he prayed Shafts of moonlight on his face But the baby in her womb he was the maker of the moon. He was the author of the thing that could make the mountains move. It was a labor of pain. It was a cold sky above. For the girl on the ground in the dark. Every beat of a beautiful heart, it was a labor of love. It was a labor of pain. It was a cold sky above. For the girl on the ground in the dark, with every beat of her beautiful heart. It was a labor of love. And little Mary, full of grace, with the tears upon her face, it was a labor of Thanks, Lindsay, Clyde. Uh, lots been said so far, and the good news about that is that I don't have to say much. Uh, I just want to point out some obvious things that sometimes we forget. Uh, we use a word for the fact that Jesus came and that God took on flesh and came into the world. The big religious sounding but really simple word is incarnation. Is that it, is, is it deity took on flesh and came into the world? That's what happened when Jesus was born, the Son of God. And I want to just remind us, I think you know these things or you've heard these things and you may not agree with them. That's okay. But I, th- th- these remain true. And so I want to just want to point to some things from the texts that have been read from Luke chapter 2 about the incarnation, what it means for us. It means a couple of things. Number one, the incarnation means that change is possible. The change is, real change is really possible. What do I mean? Because Jesus was born of a virgin. Let's start with that. You know he was born of a virgin, right? Hello? Y'all are like, it's Christmas Eve, dude. We got our kids wrapped in velvet dresses. Let us out of here. Uh, Because here's the deal. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, then he was born into sin, just like you and I were born into sin. And the longer we live, the more loose we get with things we should hold tightly to. Y'all going to make me get my preach on here on Christmas Eve. All right, let me just tell you. Because Christ was born of a virgin, which means he was the Son of God, who was conceived by God, his life and death made possible something that no other life or death has or will. See, Joseph and Mary, they had not come together yet, the Bible says. Joseph and Mary couldn't make God. I know that in this day and age, we think our kids are gods, but you can't make God. You just can't. Put all their accomplishment stickers on the back of the Suburban you want. They're not God. They're not. And see, this is good news because, see, if you deny the virgin birth, then you're ruling out the deity of Christ, the authority of the Bible, and you're also ruling out the fact that sinful people can be forgiven and be changed. You say, oh, we can be forgiven. We can be changed. On what basis? You're smart people. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, and that the sacrifice has to be perfect, has to never have sinned. So if Jesus is not born of a virgin, then who pays for your sins? Who pays for my sins? 
On what basis do they do this? But however, but because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, went on to live a sinless life, he could offer himself for sinners like you and me. Amen? See, the incarnation means, number one, change. Real change is really possible. Number two, the incarnation means that God cares about people. The incarnation means that God cares about people. We hear that so much that it kind of loses its efficacy, its potency, its capacity to take our breath away and kind of well up and go, God, man, I forgot that. And it's, it's rediscovered in these two little words in the birth narrative of Luke 2 where he says, for unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior. For unto you. Who is he talking to? Just those little two words, unto you. For unto you, this day in the city of David is born a Savior. He's talking to the shepherds. These guys were kind of on the outskirts of society. Society had actually given up on them because they were shepherds, and their profession uh, was pretty dirty. They watched over these, the, 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 these lambs that were going to be sacrificed uh, to pay for people's sin according to the Old Testament law. And because of the nature of their work, they were looked down upon, and, and they were considered ceremonially unclean. To put it in modern-day vernacular, or in the small town I grew up in, they were white trash. Yeah, they grew up in the trailer and went to the skating rink and smoked generic cigarettes behind their parents' back. The shepherds, you know, that's the way I grew up. And that's what people in my town thought about me and my brothers. And some of you go, hey, I relate to that. Some of you are looking at your family right now kind of going, hey, we're in the Bible. (laughs) Yeah. The incarnation means that God cares about people because of all the people God could have appeared to, he appears to them. People that society had given up on and God appears to them and says, hey, unto you is born a Savior. In other words, the grace of God is directed to the people of God. Very specific target audience. It's one thing for people to give up on you. It's another thing for you to give up on you. And I say to you tonight, don't give up on yourself because God hadn't given up on you. You may be thinking, you don't know who I am or what I did this year. I don't and I don't, but I know this, that unto you. That, that Jesus came and God took on flesh and came into the, into the world through the womb of a virgin. So I could stand before you tonight and say unto you, a Savior, somebody that can save you from the consequences of the choices you made this year. Unto you. See, the incarnation means God cares about people. Thirdly, the incarnation reminds us that, that God works in his time and not ours. Let me say that again. Because we preachers can say things that don't make any sense to anybody but us. And we walk away and go, that was awesome. Uh, the incarnation reminds us that God works in his time, not ours. Let's face it. As we said here tonight, some of us are still waiting for God to, for something to happen. It's not that God can't do it. It's just that so far he hasn't done it and we're still waiting. And the longer it takes, we can kind of fluctuate in our capacity to believe that God can do it, is going to do it, or wants to do it. For some of you, you're waiting on the phone to ring. You're waiting on your company that laid you off three months ago to call you back. And every day you get up and check the oil price to see where it is and check and see if the capacity of the phone to ring might go up or down based on the market. Some of you, you're still waiting on two blue lines to show up on a little stick. Some of you are waiting on the guy you're sitting next to to pop the question. If that's you, if you'll see me right down front after the service, we have a nice backdrop here. We can, I'm just saying, Merry Christmas to you. We can get that taken care of here tonight. And you can tell everybody we had a winter wedding. And the Bible says, and while they were there, The time came for her to give birth. The time is coming. It just hadn't come yet. See, the Bible used two different words to talk about time. It talks about chronos, which is chronological. That's what we do. But the Bible refers, the other word is kairos, and it's the way God keeps time. It's not chronological. It's in the fullness of time. See, we waste time, but in God's timing, time fills up. So then the fullness of time, things happen as they should, when they should, and how they should. And the incarnation reminds us that in the fullness of time, when that, while they were there, while they would just happen to be going, responding to this census that, 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 that the governor of Syria, Quirinius, said, hey, everyone's got to go back to their hometown. It's not a happenstance. It's not coincidence they were there and, and in that city and in that manger. Why? Because the incarnation reminds us that, hey, God, God, God does things in his time, not ours. And so before you go to bed tonight, God knows your head and your heart. You ain't got to tell him, I'm sorry for being angry, but you might want to tell him on top of, hey, this is frustrating. You might want to tell him, okay, I I believe you got this. 
Because what is it that he doesn't have? The Bible says that the whole world is held together by him. Fourth thing the incarnation reminds us is that the incarnation reminds, make, makes heaven possible. It makes heaven possible. You say, well, what do you mean? He came to live in her so that he could one day live in you. I have friends who think I'm crazy because I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, I have friends that laugh in my face and go, man, you're smarter than that, aren't you? Uh, and I always just say the same thing back to them. He was born the same way you're born again because they always want to get down. How can a virgin give birth to a baby? And I say, Jesus was born in, in, of a virgin the same way that you and I are born again, that people are, are changed, and they always go, well, how does that happen? So the Bible says that the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that's the way people come to Christ, the power of the Most High, the power of God, the Spirit of God reveals the truth to them. And all of a sudden, you find yourself wanting to do things you've never wanted to do before. Because who you are changes what you do changes. And so the incarnation reminds us that, hey, it's what makes heaven possible. Jesus came uncorrupted by sin so that he could redeem those who've been corrupted by sin. And, and, and he came into a world that, that's a lot like the mangers. I said earlier, it's a place of stench and noise and cold foulness where beasts live. That's the human heart. It's a place by nature of stench and foulness where beasts live, the things you're capable of. Why do I tell you that? You're like, come on, man, it's Christmas Eve. Be happy. This is the greatest gift I could give you. That because Christ came into the manger and the cattle were lowing. Just listen. Stop pinching your kids. <laughs> you hear them, they're like, we should be grandmas right now opening presents. Tell that man to shut up. It was that much chaos going on in the manger. And yet God chose to be born into that. Why do I tell you? Regardless of the state of your heart, your heart is not so cold and foul that God wouldn't come to live inside there. You say, I, I, what do you mean the incarnation makes heaven possible? Say, let me say it like this. God came to earth so people could go to heaven. God came to earth in the form of a baby so people could go to heaven. That's why the incarnation reminds us it, it, it makes heaven possible. And lastly, let me just say this. It, God does big things in little ways. The incarnation reminds us that God does big things in little ways. Uh, Adele is coming in concert in, into our city in November of next year. Uh, that's 11 months from now. And tickets sold out in a matter of hours, okay? Don't ruin it for my wife, but that's what I got her for Christmas, no, I can't afford that. They bought the tickets. Are you kidding me? I work for the church. <laughs> I'm a real Christian. I don't go to concerts. Uh, unless we dig up Johnny Cash, then I'm first in line. <laughs> no, Adele comes to town, and they sell out tickets in a matter of nanoseconds, and then the next day they're on sale on the Internet on eBay for $12,000 a ticket. And they got fanfare. And if you're in her fan club, you get access and you get to buy the tickets first. And people are like, where'd all the tickets go? And blah, 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 blah. And all this stuff. And I mean, nothing against Adele. It, Adele is awesome, right? I mean, are, are you serious? Hello. It's great. <laughs> I got nothing against Adele. So don't walk out here in a few minutes ago. There, the dude was hating on Adele. Come on. She's incredible. No, all this stuff is going on. Adele's coming. People will pay $12,000 for those tickets, too got that over here and then the son of God leaves heaven and sneaks himself into earth in the womb of a teenage virgin no fan club no fanfare unannounced and is born and laid in a wooden manger and he he starts the whole thing off by appearing to a bunch of shepherds the dregs of society that were unclean they didn't have church clothes they didn't fit in and he says, unto you is born in this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He will save people from their sins. You see, why did this happen? Here's why it happened. Because God knew that humanity tends to trust the eyes more than the ears. He came to be among us. And the people living in darkness have seen a great light. That's why the incarnation happened. That's why God leaves heaven and comes to earth. No trumpets. No, this is going to be awesome, baby. It's going to be huge. Just a little scared teenage girl 
with the Son of God in her belly. And when the fullness of time had come, he was born. That's the incarnation. That's what it is. That's why it matters. Let me pray as we think about these things. Let's pray together. Father, thanks that you came into this world. And the Bible says a lot of things about it, but the fact of the matter is, is that you came because unless you come, we can't go. This isn't religion, it's relationship. And so we're grateful and we're mindful tonight that you came to rescue us, to be with us, to relate to us, to say, I know, I know, I know what it's like to wait. But the phone's going to ring. And the price is going to go back up. And so, Lord, we're grateful tonight. And we just stop in the midst of a crazy, busy season to say we get it, we understand, and we remember. You didn't have a lot of fanfare, but you continue to make a difference. So for that, we're grateful. So we say thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, we light this candle as a reminder that Christ saw our darkness and he brought his light to bear on it. Let's think about this for just a moment. Without the incarnation, you're just left with a bunch of religious sentiment, which is why a lot of people don't believe because it's all they've ever seen. They've not seen flesh and blood, Christianity lived out. They haven't had anybody love them at their lowest point and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not better than you. That's what the Bible calls us to. After the, the birth, the Bible says this. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And then they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. Here, verse 17 again. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. God doesn't expect an overwhelming thing from you, but he expects you to make known what's been told to you. One of the traditions we have here at Grand Parkway is what we call passing the peace. And so I've asked some of our staff and families, and they're going to come now and help us observe this beautiful ritual. Because this is the way it all started. It started with... God appearing to shepherds. And they said, come, let's make known the mystery. And so people, the shepherds kind of stood around to each other. And so as, as it began to spread,
peace of Christ. And so one person told another person and told another person. And just a minute, after all of them had lit their candle, they're going to each come to a section. They're going to light your candle. And they're going to say to you, peace of Christ. And all I ask you to do is after your candle's lit, just very carefully turn around and light the candle of the person behind you. And as you do, just whisper to them, peace of Christ. And then we'll just pass it back. You don't have to do anything but the person right behind you. And it'll just pass back. So if you guys will go to your sections now, and we'll pass the peace. And as we do that, we're going to celebrate with this very familiar Christmas carol. Let's sing this together. Just be still for a minute. It happens every year. It happened again this year. We start off, and the light's not moving fast enough. And some efficient person takes their candle and starts walking back and lighting everybody else's candle. Because the people in the back are like, we don't have any light. And that's just exactly what our world's like. There are people in this world that don't have any light. And they're just waiting for someone to say to them, hey, you got lunch plans on Tuesday? 
hey, man, I know you're going through a rough patch in your marriage. I understand you get, just recently got divorced. You got dinner plans on Friday. We'd love to have you over. The light came into this world so that we could take the light to the people that need it. We're not better than them. We're just responsible. Make known what has been told to you about the baby. Let me speak a blessing over you and we'll be dismissed. Don't hold your hands out because I don't want you to pour wax on your neighbor. (laughs) May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you and dismissed.